I'd like to wish everyone a warm welcome and hello. Welcome to today's webinar. So my name is Bill Callery. I'm Manager of Programs and Knowledge Exchange at the Chronic Disease Prevention Alliance of Canada, or CDPAC. And I'm going to be co-moderating the webinar with one of our uh, moderators from the Public Health Agency. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with CDPAC, we're a network of many of Canada's largest national healthy living and disease prevention organizations who've really come together to work around the common determinants of chronic disease. And we've got our website and social media contacts at the bottom of the screen. So if you'd like, you can check us out and view some of our uh, recorded webinars and past and upcoming events. So um, today's webinar, it's entitled Positive Mental Health Surveillance Indicator Framework on InfoBase for Adults. And uh, it's part of a series of webinars being co-hosted by CDPAC and the Public Health Agency of Canada's Centre for Chronic Disease Prevention. Today's webinar is going to be showcasing the Positive Mental Health Surveillance Indicator Framework, which was really created to provide information on mental health outcomes and associated risk and protective factors. We're also going to be seeing an interactive showcase or demo of the online InfoBase and giving you an opportunity to, to ask, uh, ask questions and have, uh, uh, have a bit of a discussion with our presenters. So uh, we're thrilled to be uh, bringing you the webinar today and uh, as well looking forward to continuing to offer our ongoing series of webinars with the Public Health Agency through the rest of this year. And I'm uh, really pleased to introduce our presenters and Q&A moderator today from the Public Health Agency. Um, our Q&A moderator, Tanya Larry, um, she's going to be chairing the questions and discussion with our presenters. Tanya Larry is the Manager of Positive Mental Health, Suicide and Family Violence Surveillance. Previously, she worked on family, family violence policy and on the federal response to HIV AIDS. And prior to joining the agency, she worked at CEDA and UNICEF, focusing on child rights, monitoring and evaluation, and maternal and child health. Our first presenter, Dr. Gaia Jayaraman, will be uh, uh, providing a little bit of an introduction and background to today's webinar. Uh, Dr. Jayaraman is the Chief of Behavioral and Environmental Surveillance and Epidemiology at the Center for Chronic Disease Prevention. Uh, an in infectious disease epidemiologist by training, she remains actively involved in research aimed at understanding the intersection of chronic and infectious behavioral epidemiology, including transmission dynamics among at-risk risk populations. Prior to joining the federal health portfolio, she worked on the public health program development with various bilateral and non-governmental organizations in East Africa, India, Vietnam, and the Balkans. And she is an adjunct professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Community Medicine at the University of Ottawa. And our second presenter, Karen Pearson, uh, will be doing, uh, presenting most of the, the webinar today and also doing an interactive demonstration of the InfoBase, uh, the online InfoBase, and showing you a few examples of the types of data that you can access through there. So uh, Karen Pearson, she's an analyst with Public Health Agency of Canada. She joined the agency in 2015, working on the Positive Mental Health Surveillance Indicator Frameworks. She previously worked as an analyst at Statistics Canada, where she was working on various sources of mental health data and published articles on the mental health of Canadians. Karen completed her master's in sociology from Carleton University, where her research focused on material and psychosocial associations with positive mental health. At this point, I think I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Jaya Raman. Perfect. Um, thank you, Bill, and, and thank you for hosting this session. So I'm just going to take two minutes to set some context for this work, um, and so I'll just get right into it. We all know that overall health is dependent on both physical as well as mental health. Uh, positive mental health in and of itself is conceptualized as a state of well-being that all individuals, regardless of whether they're experiencing a mental illness, are able to enhance. So the work that will be presented to you shortly really supports the promotion of positive mental health as an important public health activity in its own right. There's just three points I'd like to make before I hand over to Karen for, or for, for the bulk of the presentation. The first is that the positive mental health framework that you're about to see actually fills, um, based on our fairly extensive uh, review of the literature as well as consultations, it fills a really important data gap. This gap is also identified in Canada's mental health strategy, and indeed, I would venture to say that it's seminal work that, to our knowledge, is the only available tool internationally that reports on positive mental health at a national level. So it's quite groundbreaking in that context. 
The second is that we feel the work is fairly innovative in that it seeks to um, access information from both traditional as well as typically non-traditional data sources. It incorporates new measures for reporting, and finally, it seeks to put out information using a variety of modalities, including peer-reviewed publications, infographics, data, blogs, social media, and the interactive web tool that, um, that, that Karen will be presenting um, shortly. And the third point, and this is probably the most important piece, is that the major success of this work has really been on the collaborative approach that it's taken, building and developing really strong partnerships for which we're extraordinarily grateful. So in addition to those that you'll be hearing from today, I really do want to give a shout out to Heather Orpana, Julie Vachon, and Jen Dykeshorn, who did a lot of the heavy lifting at the front end of the framework development to our colleagues within the agency in the Center for Health Promotion, as well as the federal, provincial, territorial um, colleagues within the Mental Health Promotion Task Group. They were really vital, instrumental in providing their program and policy direction for, for this work. The Mental Health Commission of Canada and other colleagues within the Mental Health and Addictions Data Collaborative, as well as the FPT Mental Health Mental Illness Surveillance Technical Working Group for their expert input as well. So with that, I'm hoping that this work will be useful from your um, perspective, for your respective in initiatives. Really looking forward to hearing your feedback, either at the end of today's presentation or afterwards. So with that, I'll hand over to Karen for, um, for the presentation. Well, thank you for that introduction, Gaia. Um, so my name is Karen Pearson, and I'm going to be taking you through the presentation, as Gaia said. And so just to take you through what to expect this afternoon, I'm first going to present to you the process involved in developing the Positive Mental Health Surveillance Indicator Framework. And then for the second half of the webinar, I will take you through how you can use this framework on the agency's online data tool, InfoBase, where you can obtain estimates for each one of the indicators identified in the framework by key socio-demographic factors. So this tool allows researchers to deep a little digger into the data and obtain breakdowns by factors such as sex, age, province, income, immigrant status, and urban or rural status. So what is positive mental health? The Public Health Agency defines positive mental health as a state of well-being that allows us to feel, think, and act in ways that enhance our ability to enjoy life and deal with the challenges we face. It is a positive sense of emotional and spiritual well-being that respects the importance of culture, equity, social justice, interconnections, and personal dignity. Positive mental health is a state of well-being that all individuals are able to experience, regardless of whether they experience a mental illness. So why should the Public Health Agency of Canada measure positive mental health? Mental health is important to everyday living and has a large impact on various domains. For instance, mental health has links to good physical health and well-being, healthy relationships, ability to cope with difficulties, and a reduction in the risks of mental illness. According to the Mental Health Association, when we are mentally healthy, we enjoy our life and environment and the people in it. We can be creative, learn, try new things, and take risks, and we are better able to cope with difficult times in our personal and professional lives. The agency's role in measuring positive mental health grew out of the surveillance gap identified in the Mental Health Strategy, Changing Directions, Changing Lives by the Mental Health Commission of Canada. The strategy recommended strengthening data and research to develop a better understanding of the mental health needs of diverse population groups and improving data collection, research, and knowledge of mental health. The agency had strong surveillance programs in place to monitor and report on a range of topics related to chronic disease, injury, and health behaviors including mental illness and suicide. But before 2013, there was no surveillance system focusing on the positive mental health of Canadians. In response, the agency developed the Positive Mental Health Surveillance Indicator Framework. This framework was developed in consultation with stakeholders and experts to provide information on positive mental health outcomes as well as associated risk and protective factors. So a lot of work went into developing this framework by my colleagues in various departments and organizations, and so like Gaia, I want to start out with a big thank you to everyone has, who has contributed to this project. So I'm going to start off with a very brief overview of the process. However, if you are interested in more information on the development of this framework, the January edition of the agency's journal, Health Promotion and Chronic Disease Prevention in Canada, contains an article that provides an in-depth overview of the development of the framework for all the life courses, so for adults, youth, and children. And so to begin, um, we all started with an environmental scan of relevant publications and existing data sources. And then based on these searches, a conceptual framework was developed in consultation with the Mental Health Commission of Canada experts, 
Once the consultation, oh, sorry, once the conceptual framework was identified, indicators and measures were added to the framework. Indicators are concepts that can be measured and reported on, and the measures operationalize the indicators through available data, such as survey questions or scales. Indicators were prioritized according to five selection criteria, which were relevant, actionable, accurate, feasible, and ongoing. So the initial list included five outcome indicators and 77 risk and protective indicators. A series of consultation processes were undertaken to reduce this list. The Mental Health and Mental Illness Surveillance Advisory Committee, which advises the agency on the evaluation of mental health and mental illness, as well as the Mental Health Promotion Task Group, a group which works to identify key tasks on mental health promotion to help bring greater visibility to mental health promotion and its impacts on Canadians, were invited to provide feedback and to prioritize this list. At the end of consultation, there were five outcome indicators and 25 risk and protective factors. So once the indicators were selected, Canadian population-based surveys were reviewed to identify measures for each of the indicators. Measures were selected from data sources that could provide estimates at the national level. More consultation was conducted with stakeholders to gain advice on the best measures and to prioritize the measures identified. Once the framework, indicators, and measures were finalized, data analysis and the production of knowledge products began. The first of which, an infographic, was released in January of 2015, and in this past January, our framework was launched on InfoBase as well as our quick statistics. So the framework is intended to be evergreen. So data val uh, validation and content reviews will occur on an ongoing basis to reflect the latest available evidence. So the indicator framework is a socio-ecological model, meaning that it captures the interwoven relationships of individuals at multiple levels, such as between families, the community, and society. This infographic here presents the domains, individual, family, community, and society, in which risk and protective factors exist. Each domain influences the positive mental health of the population, and as such, can be a potential entry point for interventions that can promote positive mental health. Positive mental health outcomes were chosen based on the contemporary positive mental health theory and well-being. The framework identifies three life course stages, children ages 0 to 11, youth ages 12 to 17, and adults ages 18 and older. The indicators included in the framework are the same for each age group, except for the school environment indicator, which only applies to the youth and child life course. While the indicators are the same, the way they are measured does change according to the life stage. So for example, the adult framework, one of the measures for the indicator of violence is spousal violence, while for youth it is measured through bullying. So the literature on positive mental health outcomes broadly covers two areas, feeling good and functioning well. Feeling good means that you feel happy and satisfied with your life. Functioning well means that you are able to participate in meaningful activities and have positive relationships with others. In our framework, we are using the indicators self-rated mental health happiness, and life satisfaction to measure the concept of feeling good. Psychological well-being and social well-being are used to measure the concept of functioning well. We did encounter some challenges when setting out to measure our outcomes for positive mental health. The mental health continuum short form, developed by Corey Keyes, was initially identified to measure our outcome indicators for positive mental health. However, through data analysis, we found the short form continuum to be problematic. Canadians were reporting very high rates of flourishing compared to other studies. Looking at the individual components of the scale, the emotional and psychological well-being subscales were found to function well and are included in the framework. However, the social well-being scale was not functioning well within a Canadian context. For many of the questions making up the scale, there were high rates of missing data, which may have skewed the reliability of this measure. Sense of community belonging is currently proposed as the best available measure for the social well-being indicator as it reflects social engagement and participation within communities, which are key components of social well-being. So as mentioned earlier, these are the positive mental health outcomes identified in the framework and their corresponding estimates. Self-rated mental health is an individual's global assessment of their mental health. Happiness is a state of well-being characterized by positive or pleasant emotions. Satisfaction with life is a global assessment, evaluation, or judgment of satisfaction with one's life based on an individual's own criteria. Psychological well-being means that a person is able to meet developmental or life challenges, achieve personal goals, find meaning in life, and experience autonomy, mastery, self-acceptance, and positive relations with others. To have high psychological well-being, respondents had to report on average almost every day or every day to the six psychological well-being questions contained in the mental health continuum short form. 
As mentioned earlier, community belonging is currently being used as a measure for social well-being. As you can see here, it seems as though Canadian adults are doing pretty well with their positive mental health. However, when we move to InfoBase later on in this presentation and begin to disaggregate these outcome indicators by key socio-demographic characteristics, we will see that some population groups are faring better than others. And so the next few slides will highlight some estimates of indicators found within the individual, family, community, and society levels of our framework. So looking at some highlights of risk and protective indicators at the individual and family domains. Individual behaviors and experiences are associated with positive mental health. We found that 57% of Canadians reported that they could cope well with unexpected and difficult problems and day-to-day -day demands. 42% of Canadians report that they have a high level of control over their life chances. Healthy family relationships provide an important foundation for positive mental health. We found that 36% of Canadians who have a family member who has problems with their emotions, mental health, or use of alcohol or drugs reported that their life is affected a lot or some by their family members' mental health problems. All these estimates were calculated through analysis of the 2012 Canadian Community Health Survey Mental Health. And so now looking at some highlights of risk and protective indicators at the community and society domains. So positive mental health is supported by strong ties to the community. About 87% of Canadians reported that their neighborhood is a place where neighbors help each other. And at the society level, factors such as discrimination and stigma are related to positive mental health. About 21% of Canadians with a mental health problem reported having been affected by negative opinions or unfair treatment due to their mental health problem. So this was the first infographic we released in January of 2015. It is the first in a series of infographics, and it highlights key findings within each domain of our framework. So our next infographics should be released in 2016, so please stay tuned. And so now I'm going to shift the second part of our presentation, and we're going to move to InfoBase. And this is a series of tools that help visualize and analyze health data. Using InfoBase, you can obtain the latest estimates for each indicator of the framework, and you can disaggregate each indicator by key socio-demographic factors, such as age, sex, province, income, immigrant status, and rural or urban status. So these disaggregations allow us to identify population groups that may be having a harder time obtaining positive mental health than others. I included in the presentation a link to InfoBase, and then when you click that link, you should make it to our homepage for InfoBase. And so this is it. And currently, we have two indicator frameworks loaded onto InfoBase. We have the Chronic Disease and Injury Indicator Framework, and we have our Positive Mental Health Surveillance Indicator Framework. And this is the one I'm going to be taking you through today. And so to get in, we just click the Positive Mental Health Surveillance Indicator Framework button. And so this is our homepage for the Positive Mental Health Surveillance Indicator Framework. We have some text to the side. And then to the right, we have our Quick Stats document. And so this Quick Stats document is just kind of like a cover page for what's available in InfoBase. It has all of our indicators in the framework um, organized by domain. So this is our Positive Mental Health Outcome domain, and then the individual domain and family determinant. Um, the indicators are listed on the left, and then we have how they're measured in the middle, and then the latest data, and then the source for the data. So each um, data point that you're seeing um, right here, when we go into InfoBase, you're actually able to break this data point down by all those key demographic factors that I was speaking to earlier. And if we keep scrolling down to the bottom, we get kind of a quick stats overview. And so it lists all of our domains from our framework, and you can just click the plus button to expand them. And again, it's um, giving a pretty brief overview of what you'll see in Quick Stats, but the main exception is that you can hit this button, Description. And in the description, um, you get a little bit more information about how we calculated some of our data points. So for this one, um, I clicked on self-rated mental health, and so we get the definition, our data source, um, the population it was calculated on, um, for data available, these are the breakdowns that are available for this data point in um, InfoBase. And we have the methods of calculation, so we have our numerator and our denominator. And so for this particular indicator, um, the numerator was number of adults 18 and older who report that their mental health is very good or excellent, and the denominator is the Canadian population aged 18 plus. And then we just have additional notes to help interpret the result that you get. So um, in this case, a positive or a high result can be interpreted as a positive result. And so to get back to our info base, you just click the return to the health indicator framework. 
Um, we do also have a survey highlighted on here. So after the presentation, if you do go into InfoBase, um, it would be great if you could take just maybe five minutes, fill out five questions. It helps us um, better design the tool for you and help uh, your data needs. And so to build some tables, we click this green button, uh, the Use the um, Positive Mental Health Framework tool. And so it takes us through a few layers to get to our data table. Um, so um, at the moment, we only have one edition, uh, the 2016 edition. So by default, we have to click this one. If anyone is familiar with our other framework, there are more than one editions. And because this is supposed to be evergreen, we will have um, hopefully more than one coming soon. Um, and then it's always good to be able to return, uh, refer back to them. So we will keep all of them up here. So for now, we just have to click 2016. And then it asks us to select our domain. And so we have five different domains. Uh, for this table, we'll stick to the positive mental health outcomes domain. And then after that, we get to select the indicator that we want to look at from this domain. Um, and so for this one, let's select psychological well-being. And then we get to select our life course. As I mentioned, we do have three life courses. We have adult, youth, and children. We're working on the youth and children one uh, now. We're hoping that the children's will come out probably later in 2016. So when that does come out, um, you'll be able to see um, the different frameworks. But for now, uh, we're presenting on adults. And then uh, for some of our indicators, there are more than one measure. Uh, for this particular indicator, we just have the one measure, so percent of the population who have high psychological well-being. While it's loading, I'm just going to pop in to say sorry, that the youth indicator yeah. framework will be available later in 2016, and the children's one will, will uh, take a bit longer because not all the data sources are avail mm -hmm. available yet. Thank you. There we go. Perfect timing. And so for this uh, measure, we're able to break it down by sex, age group, household income, province, territory, urban, rural residence, and immigration status, or immigrant status. And so for this one, I'll do province and territory just because we have a bunch of people here from across the country, so it might be interesting. And so this is our results page. And so InfoBase just quickly recaps um, what we asked it to do. So we chose the 2016 edition. We chose the positive mental health outcomes domain. We chose the indicator psychological well-being. Um, we chose the age group 18 plus. Um, we have the measure, the percentage of population who have high psychological well-being and it's for the population 18 plus, and we asked um, this to be disaggregated by province or territory. And I should have mentioned earlier, um, our ability to disaggregate is dependent on the data. And so for this one, we're not able to um, disseminate by province or by territory as the territory data was not available to us. So I apologize to anyone coming to us from the territories. And so InfoBase presents the data first as a graph and as a table. And so you can actually right click on the graph and you can save the picture or copy the picture into Microsoft Word, into Outlook, into a PowerPoint presentation. And then the same goes for our table as well. Um, you can copy it and save it and import it into Excel for further analysis if that's what you want to do. And then further down, um, we just have some notes about data. Um, so cells highlighted in red indicate that we're not able to release the data. Um, as you can see here, none of our cells are highlighted in red, so we're good. And then we just include the data source at the bottom, too. So all this data that you're seeing right now it comes to us from the 2012 Canadian Community Health Survey Mental Health. And so going back to our data results, we can kind of see that there's some variation among provinces, but not really too much. Um, it looks like people in the east are a little bit doing a little bit better on high psychological well-being than people in the West, but um, this is kind of common in the well-being literature. So that's kind of interesting. And so I'm going to run another table for us. And so we can either hit return to indicator framework, which takes us back to our main page, or I could have clicked the other button, which would have taken us right to um, the domain. And so again, we'll take uh, 2016. And so again, let's look at positive mental health outcomes. Okay, let's look at self-rated mental health this time. And again, we'll do adult. And then this was our only measure, so we'll choose that one. And then for this one, let's look at it by household income. And so again, we get a little summary. Um, so we chose the 2016 edition, our positive mental health outcomes. We chose self-rated mental health. And then we chose to break this one down by um, income status. 
And so here's our charts that we can um, put into our various formats like Word, PowerPoint, um, Outlook. And then again, none of our cells are highlighted in red, so we know that our data is of good quality. And again, all this data is coming to us from the 2012 Canadian Community Health Survey. And so looking at our graph, we can see that there's quite a bit of variation in the proportion of Canadians who rate their self-rated mental health um, as very good or excellent by income. Uh, so people in the highest, or people with incomes in the highest 20% um, rate their, or a greater proportion of them rate their mental health as very good or excellent compared to Canadians in the, uh, with incomes in the lowest 20%. And we can actually see that as income increases, so does um, the proportion of people who rate their mental health as very good or excellent. So these are very interesting findings, which would be um, really interesting to explore further in uh, for, uh, future research. And so we'll do another table. And so we'll just hit the Select Another Indicator button. And again, we'll start off with uh, 2016. Uh, this time, let's move into some community determinants. Uh, for this one, let's look at community involvement. And again, we'll do adults 18 years and older. And so for this um, indicator, we have the one measure, the percentage of population who are members of or participate in at least one recreational or professional organization, group, association, or club. And then we have all the breakdowns again, the same breakdowns. Um, let's try this one by immigrant status this time. And again, we have our summary here. And we chose the community determinants. We chose the indicator community involvement. Um, we chose the measure of people who are participating in a um, community organization or club. And we chose to disaggregate by immigrant status. Um, again, we can see that our data quality is good. We have no cells um, highlighted. And all this data is coming to us from the 2008 General Social Survey Social Network. And so looking at our graph, we can see that um, Canadian-born population is actually more likely than the immigrant population to participate in clubs or community associations, which is pretty interesting. Um, if we actually go back um, into InfoBase and look at our positive mental health outcomes, and we look at social well-being, pretty interesting because um, immigrants actually reported that they had a stronger um, sense of belonging to their local communities uh, than the Canadian-born population. Yeah, so we can see here that um, respondents who said that they were immigrants actually um, had higher rates of reporting that they very strongly or somewhat strongly belonged to their local community. So it's interesting to play between um, graphs and tables that you can make in InfoBase to make a story. So while immigrants are less likely to participate in community um, associations or clubs, they are actually more likely to report that they strongly or somewhat strongly belong to their local communities than the Canadian-born population. Um, so yes, the link for InfoBase is uh, provided to you in the presentation. Um, I encourage you guys to um, come on to InfoBase when you're um, done this presentation, play with the data, maybe go in with some questions that you want a little bit more, um, more information on and just see how InfoBase can help you with your research and your data needs. And so I'm just going to go back to the presentation now and finish off with uh, our next step. And so um, as Tanya and I mentioned earlier, we are currently finalizing measures for our youth framework, um, and we are hoping to report um, in fall 2016. Uh, we are identifying measures for the child framework right now, and we're working with our colleagues over at Statistics Canada on the Canadian Health Survey for Children and Youth to develop content that can provide measures for positive mental health in children. And again, as the framework is intended to be evergreen, we will be reviewing content on a regular basis and updating our products to reflect the latest available evidence. And so I'm going to leave it there. Um, thank you all for participating in this webinar today and learning a little bit more about our um, surveillance indicator framework and how to access this on InfoBase. Great. Thanks very much, Karen, and uh, as well, Gaia, for the introduction. All right, so in questions and discussion, I think we've got uh, at least uh, 25 minutes, uh, even longer likely. Um, so we've got lots of time to answer questions, and I see that, uh, that some of you have already been submitting your questions, which is great, so keep those coming. Oh, wonderful, we've got lots of questions coming in now. So I think I'll hand it over to, uh, to Tanya Larry to uh, begin our questions period. 
Hi, everybody. Um, thanks very much, Karen, and thanks, Bill. We've had some questions come in already, and I'll just do them in order that they came in. Um, for geography, can we get results at a, at a more local level, at the city or at a regional level? Um, right now in InfoBase, we're only presenting at the um, provincial and territorial level, um, just because our focus was on a national level. Um, where the surveys permit, though, I think with the Canadian Community Health Survey, it does go down to the city level as well as the health region level. So it is possible to get those results, but I think it would require um, submitting like a custom tab to Statistics Canada to get those information. Thanks, Karen. And next question is, are the results for the positive mental health surveillance indicator framework drawn from the share files? That's the public use microdata files the pumps or for both for the surveys that are cited? Uh, we're drawing from the share files. And then an interesting question about what was the thinking behind the inclusion of immigrant status given that the profile for non-recent immigrants is typically similar to Canadian born? And there's a recommendation that we should examine the data by recent immigrant status if numbers permit, particularly at the individual level. Do you remember this one, Kaya? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Can we break down by immigrant status, like how many years the person has been in the country, basically? What's our non-recent versus recent immigrants? With our data restrictions, we're not really able to. It's just such a small sample size, so we weren't able to break it down by those levels, or else we wouldn't be able to release any data on immigrants um, in general. But I think Gaia, um, no, you wanted to that's exactly okay. right. I mean. You know, to, to, to that question and to some others, to the extent the data are available, we'd be really interested in, in, in reporting, but not all of the data are disaggregatable to levels that we would like just based on, on sample size or honestly data availability. So that's our rate determining factor at this, at this stage. Okay, thank you. Next question, uh, do we follow up with survey respondents sending mental health resources to them? Uh, no, we don't. Um, Statistics Canada just um, collects the information and then disseminates it to us. Um, they do, so, um, so in the Canadian Community Health Survey, the annual component, um, people who identified having a mental health problem, they were sent an additional survey, um, which I think we're starting to get the results back from now, but uh, the agency doesn't follow up on um, particular responses or particular participants. And just to, to make that, to mm -hmm. underline it, it is Statistics Canada who, who runs the surveys that we're using, uh, mm -hmm. not the public health agents. And, and, but, but to kind of also point to the direction that we're going, which is, you know, we have questions that might not necessarily be captured by way of surveys. And so to the point that was made initially where we are exploring other types of data sources, that we could start accessing to, um, to get some information on positive mental health. And so some of these areas, and this is where that innovation part comes in, some of these areas could be um, areas such as social media. I mean, we have to think this through. We have to think through questions like representativeness and so on, which are important from a surveillance perspective. But certainly we want to be in the business of um, understanding what data sources might be optimally used to inform our measures as identified through our various stakeholder consultations. So towards that end, even though it might not be currently available through surveys, it may be available, whatever it is, might be available through other data sources that we need to kind of think through and explore. Next question, will you be able to break down the youth framework by the same socio-demographic factors as the adult framework? Uh, this is really dependent on the data. So for the youth framework, we are using different data sources than the adult frameworks, and so we're really just constrained by the data. So um, we would ideally like to keep it the, the same, but we do base our data constraints there. Have you determined data that considers single parent families? Is that something that we, we can pull out of the community health survey? It is. We do have it as an indicator. We don't have it as a disaggregator. So going forward, um, we, um, we'll put this on the list of things to consider going forward as a possible disaggregator. Yeah. 
good point because I think we have it as a family composition. We do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily as a disaggregator. So that's that's a really good suggestion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because we, we got a related question saying it, uh, it's good to see the family domain indicators. Do you also plan to stratify by family or household status for that single? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Another recommendation to do mm -hmm. the same. Um, here is and it, a comment saying we mentioned that the innovative nature of the framework, yet all the content seems to be pulled from established surveys. Do you have any plans to develop indicators that measure mental health in novel ways? and to develop sources or tools to collect those indicators. So I'll, I'll take a crack at this okay. and yeah. get Robin and um, Karen and Tanya to respond as well. So, um, so you'll notice within the framework, including the adult framework, that we actually have data gaps. So, you know, there are indicators for which we currently don't have measures nor do we have data sources identified. So I think that is potentially one area. I think resilience is one yes. where, um, where, you know, there's lots of great work happening within specific communities. I mean, the Aboriginal population is, is such a, has such a wealth of information around resiliency. To what extent those measures are applicable to the general population, we don't know. To what extent we need to be looking at data sources that are not typically survey generated, you know, we don't know. So, so looking at the data gaps, I think, is one area that um, pushes us to explore the, the so-called non-traditional data sources. The other piece, too, is we know over time, um, you know, there's, there's a risk of attrition from, from survey respondents. Um, we know that there's a potential for participation rates to decline depending on the tool that's used to access individuals, I mean, telephone-based surveys, et cetera. So we have to be thinking outside of um, just dependencies on surveys in order to be um, in the business of capturing information that's, that's relevant and timely. So that's another reason um, that pushes us to, to look at non-traditional. Now, in terms of data sources, that may be useful. I mentioned social media mm -hmm. as a possibility, and we're exploring some of that, very much an exploratory phase. And, um, you know, we're very interested in, in hearing from you on, 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 on this conference if you have some other suggestions of data sources that might be of value as well. Like we haven't quite figured it out, but we recognize that we need to be looking, um, looking to other types of data in addition to survey to address some of these data needs. Joanne, you just touched a little bit on some of the work that's being done in Aboriginal positive mental health and resilience. And uh, could you maybe speak to this other, another question that it, I notice it's not possible to obtain estimates and info based by Aboriginal status. Will this be added in a future edition? So um, our, we're very much interested in working with um, the various stakeholders. Um, particularly Aboriginal populations, First Nations, Inuit Health, Branch at Health Canada, um, et cetera, to try and identify what indicators might make the best sense to report on for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit populations. We also know that it might not make sense to directly apply indicators and measures that were built to report on the general population and just kind of copy-paste that to report on, you know, Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal. The other point is that, you know, even Aboriginal, in a sense, has First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. So clumping up the Aboriginal population under one category has, um, has challenges to that as well. So it's with those kinds of perspectives and considerations in mind that at this stage we were advised, and rightly so, to not have breakdown by Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal, but we're very interested, and in fact we have started conversations with, um, with Health Canada and through them with other organizations to help us unpack how reporting can be done on positive mental health for the various Aboriginal populations. So that's very much on our radar. And, but it's also very much work in progress from at least our, our reporting purposes. Thank you. Karen, a question for you. Uh, can you tell us what the response rate was for this survey? I don't have it off the top of my head, but I can um, research it and send it out to the people at CDPAC to disseminate it. But I remember it being pretty high for a survey, so. And StatsCan reports on that on their website. They do. 
yeah. um, by survey. They do, yes. Okay. Um, where will the data be coming from for the children and youth indicators? Will you be using different information sources? And if so, how will you be able to compare mental well-being in youth versus adults? Uh, yes, so we are um, starting right now. Um, a lot of the surveys will be the same, so the Canadian Community Health Survey. We're trying to keep it as similar as possible where we can, um, but we are using more youth-oriented surveys, so like the Health Behaviors of School-Aged Children Survey. Um, we're also using the um, Canadian Student Tobacco and Alcohol and Drug Survey. Um, and so, um, I don't know if the intention is to actually compare youth with adults, but it's more just to present um, kind of an overview of how youth are doing. Okay. Um, might you add, here's a suggestion for, for the built environment, mm -hmm. might we add an indicator reflecting the circumstance of the natural environment in which people live and on, upon which people depend? Not sure I understand the question by way of circumstance of natural environment. Yeah, uh, we are working with um, people at Statistics Canada on the Canadian Community Health Survey to develop um, GIS reporting. So we would actually be able to see um, kind of what the neighborhoods look like, like if there's a park nearby, if there's a recreational facility. Um, so that's very much in development right now, and we're hoping for the next edition of the framework that we'll be able to report on some of those things, like walkability scores. And, yeah, so it will be interesting later on. Okay. I, um, I the question is, do you qualify persons currently or formally in treatment for mental illness? I, I'm guessing that's what being asked. Is that a disaggregator for some of these conditions? We don't, no. No. And, and that, in a way, was just to build on that point. I was deliberate because we really do want to be positioning the positive men, men, mental health work, much as Karen alluded to, you know, conceptualized as a state of well-being regardless of whether there's a mental illness or not, meaning everyone, um, you know, is capable of um, being in this positive mental health state, obviously provided that those with mental illness have the, um, you know, the, the, the resources and, and services that, that they are in need of available to them. But the, the positive mental health work is really conceptualized as a state of well-being available to all individuals regardless of their mental illness status. So what we didn't want to do was have a mental illness disaggregator um, because it was not really intended to be an either-or kind of um, positioning that the indicator framework was to take for surveillance purposes. Thank you. Uh, Karen, do we have a report that outlines the rationale for choosing the indicators that are in the framework? We do. Um, it was actually just released in January in the um, agency's uh, journal. Um, it's chronic, uh, chronic Disease and Promotion. Uh, um, Health Promotion Health and promotion. Chronic Disease Prevention Journal. Yes, thank you. You can find on the agency <laughs> website. And there's a detailed paper. Yes, there's a detailed paper um, written by our colleagues, um, by Julie Vashon, uh, Vashon, Gaia, and Heather Opana. Um, Louise McRae, um, and I think someone else, Jen, um, yes, Jen Dykesman, and it goes over a huge in-depth um, process of how we got where we are. It explains um, all the work gone into the framework, how we prioritize the indicators. It's a really interesting read if anyone uh, would like more information about the process. Do you plan to add multiple years of data so that we can look at time trends? Uh, we would love to do that. If anyone's familiar with uh, the other framework on the InfoBase right now, the Chronic Disease um, and Injury Indicator Framework, uh, they update regularly as data becomes available, um, and we would love to be able to do this as well. Um, it really depends on data availability. The Mental Health um, Canadian Community Health Survey that uh, we drew a lot of our data points from is only asked um, for like um, every so years, I think it's every five or ten years. Um, but like where possible, we would love to be able to update these estimates so that we have um, an idea of how positive mental health is occurring in Canada and changing over, and changing over time. And just to um, the person who asked about the report outlining our rationale, the very kind moderator at CDPAC has put on the link to our journal in, in the chat line. So thank you very much, Bill.
Um, are the indicators in this framework limited to statistical to statistics Canada data sources only? They are not. Um, a lot of our indicators do draw from Statistics Canada um, because they are available at the national level. Um, but you'll see for the youth uh, framework coming up, um, a lot of the data sources are not Statistics Canada. Okay. And this, this question takes us on a slightly different tangent, and I'm going to pose it to you, Gaia. As mental health in the workplace becomes more recognized, how do you recommend employers go about assessing employees' mental health? What indicators should we look at? Wow, um, that's, that's a really important and um, interesting question. I think that it would depend on what it is that you want to be thinking about by way of programming. I mean, arguably, all the five outcome indicators for positive mental health are relevant for those at home, in the workplace, and so on. So I would actually throw the question back to um, the person asking it. And, and if there, this was a conversation, it would be about, well, what is it that you're trying to build on? What is it that you're trying to explore? And then depending on the responses to that question, there may be you know, specific indicators that could help um, either monitor progress by way of your programming or at least help inform that progress. So, um, you know, I don't know to what extent, for example, the family or the community level indicators would be useful, um, but perhaps more of the individual level indicators might be useful. And there may be a couple of community level indicators where they're speaking of in the workplace in a, in a community type of setting. Some of those might be useful. So um, I think there might be nuggets within the framework that may be of value, but in order to identify them, we we'll probably need to be an iterative kind of conversation process. So happy to connect with you um, after or offline to discuss further. Thank you. And I, I have one more question, uh, Gaia. And this is interesting. A question about how these, uh, the, the outcome level indicators of mental health, how they compare with international um, sources. Are these, are these measures being used elsewhere? Are, is Canada sort of comparable? I know that's sort of outside of the context of this framework. So um, the outcome indicators, you'll notice that the psychological well-being scale is a part of the mental health short form, as is, um, as are um, really all of those indicators have a, have a role or a space within the mental health short form. And we know that these questions are asked more or less in various national surveys. As Karen was reporting, though, we're finding particularly when it comes to the social, social well-being that um, the Canadians are, at least based on our assessment of the survey, um, you know, there, there seems to be somewhat of a, um, it seems to be somewhat of a puzzle in the sense that the factors lining up against the social well-being questions are not lining up the way that they should be or they are intended to be, which is why we decided to, um, to look at um, community well-being, I think, in the context of, of the social well-being question. So we know that in general, looking across um, self-weighted mental health and the other four measures, as we've identified here, Canadians are doing relatively well or even better than their international counterparts. But within the Canadian context, particularly when it comes to the social well-being, we're not doing as well as we are compared to the, um, the psychological as well as the, the, the feeling good um, indicators. So the question, the interesting question becomes, well, what is it about the social well-being piece that um, we need to kind of understand further, particularly given that there's quite a bit of, you know, high response or positive responses when you're talking about feeling connected to the community and so on. So um, that area around social well-being, I think, and this is just my opinion, just merits a further investigation. But when you're looking across the other areas, we seem to be doing comparably well to, uh, compared to our, our, certainly our U.S. counterparts. But within the Canadian context, particularly when it comes to the social well-being, we're not doing as well as we are compared to the, um, the psychological as well as the, the, the feeling good um, indicators. 
So the question, the interesting question becomes, well, what is it about the social well-being piece that um, we need to kind of understand further, particularly given that there's quite a bit of, you know, high response or positive responses when you're talking about feeling connected to the community and so on. So um, that area around social well-being, I think, and this is just my opinion, just merits a further investigation. But when you're looking across the other areas, we seem to be doing comparably well to, uh, compared to our, our, certainly our U.S. counterparts, um, and, in, and in actually most of the indicators better than, than our U.S. counterparts, or just as well to our Australia, New Zealand, and, and U.K., and, and other European country counterparts. Thank you. Um, question for you, Karen. Do the indicator results show a statistical significance between population groups, such as a rural and mm -hmm. urban split? Yes. So on InfoBase, we didn't uh, like show the significance like with the asterisks because we wanted people to not be limited, uh, limited in the comparisons that we made. Um, however, the confidence intervals are shown for each estimate that we've produced. And so um, to just eyeball quick significance, if the confidence intervals between the two data points that you're comparing do not overlap, then they are significant. Gaia, how does this framework and associated indicators fit in with those that are identified by the Mental Health Commission of Canada? Ask for those of you who may not be aware, the Mental Health Commission released indicators last, yeah. um, last spring. So two things to know. Number one is that they're complementary, and in fact, we've been working really closely with the Mental Health Commission and their, their data indicators. They're complementary in the sense that the space that the positive mental health indicators occupy are really around the positive kind of health promotion type of indicators. So within the indicators that MHCC released, you'll notice that there are probably one or two that speak to positive mental health, and the one or two are really the one or two that are also represented in um, the, the positive mental health indicator framework that Karen just presented. What we've done in essence is just expand on the positive mental health um, indicators list. So in that sense, it's complementary and not duplicative of the MHCC indicator release. The second part, um, to the response is that, um, you know, we work very closely with MHCC, with CHI-HI, with StatsCan, um, with Health Canada and other stakeholders as a part of our mental health and addictions data collaborative to ensure that there were efficiencies created and to ensure that we were kind of feeding off of each other in the process. So hopefully it expands on the work as they pertain to mental health, mental illness indicators, and um, continues to be complementary, which I suspect will be the case, um, certainly is the case now and will be the case going forward. And a related question about mental illness, is anyone measuring treatment availability and effectiveness by geographic area or by population group? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's several groups that I believe are doing that. I mean, I would suspect that um, the, the MHCC indicators, I think there are a couple in there that speak to treatment accessibility. Kai hi as well does some pretty um, important work around um, mental illness and treatment. Within the agency, we look at mental illness, but more so from the perspective of prevalence and burden of um, mental illnesses across Canada. So there's multiple aspects of mental illness that are covered by, by various groups. Thank you. Um, in what ways do you hope that this tool will be used? And, and uh, a nice congratulations on this important piece of work. We actually would like to get your responses to that question because, um, you know, as, as Karen mentioned in, in one of her first slides, uh, she gave the reasons why we pulled this, um, this tool together. First of all, it being I, the area of positive mental health being identified as a data gap area by um, the, the Canada's mental health strategy. Um, secondly, just that there was a directive that, that we saw in terms of you know, being able to fill that gap given our knowledge, expertise, and, and, and partnerships that we've developed. And, and then thirdly, just from the perspective of our mental health promotion task group, which is a federal, provincial, territorial task group, who had identified a need for indicators to help support their FPT type of work, 
And so working with them, we're certainly, um, you know, supporting some of their work in, 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 in the storylines around what positive mental health promotion activities look like, how they can be monitored and measured. But that's one of the areas we'd really like your feedback if there are program policy folks on the call to, to, to let us know, you know, how this work has been useful from your perspective and honestly how it has not been useful. I mean, I think both are equally important and what types of other areas we could help support by way of your work um, to make it even more useful. And here's a comment. Um, for, for in Atlantic Canada, they've prepared a statistical snapshot of child and youth mental health in the form of a placemat, which they'd be glad to share. We'd love to see that. Um, we also, there's also an, an Atlanta, a mental health in Atlantic Canada snapshot to begin to explore social and material determinants of mental health. This can be found at publications.gc.ca. So thank you very much, that's great. Another question, has anyone pulled together the various info bases offered by the federal government so that one can access them at one location or see the data possibilities at one website? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is work that's happening at the corporate level. Um, as you might be aware, there is uh, work in moving all of the government departments, um, at least profile, to a common look and feel website. And so that's a part of the work, um, you know, in terms of data sources being, um, being pulled together under an umbrella of sorts, be it surveillance or data or open data. Um, so there is work in progress happening at, um, at a corporate level to, um, to kind of pull this information together. What we're trying to do at least within our center is to try and pull this information together within the umbrella of the info base and that's why you see you know, now two of our frameworks being represented there and others to come which will be populated there as well. So, so in our micro Fear. We're trying to do that, but I certainly know that it's happening. Those conversations are happening at, at a more macro level as well. And a question being asked if we can circulate the link. The link that was in our in the presentation is a link to all the public. You'll find all the different info bases from the public health agency yep. at that place. Mm -hmm. um, and then the the uh, there's also Canada.ca, which would have some other information. Um, I've uh, one, I'm not seeing, I see one more question, and then I wonder if we should move to close. If you, if you want to ask more questions, please type curiously now, because we'll, uh, otherwise I'm going to close it in a, in a couple of minutes. So the last question I see now is, can we link this work to the Canadian Index of Wellbeing? And that's um, something I think we need to think about. Gaia, is, is that... Yeah, I mean, we've been we've been having some preliminary thoughts and conversations around it. Um, certainly, um, you know, those the methodologists that we've been working on, Heather Opana comes to mind. Others have been, um, you know, thinking it through. Um, so, so there's multiple approaches. We just haven't landed on what makes the best sense, and ultimately, I suppose that will be dictated by to what end, right? Like, how will it then be of value? How can it then be used by, by, um, by those who are, are kind of wanting this, this linkage to happen? So um, that and other ways of reporting are, are certainly, you know, works in progress. And, and as Karen mentioned, this whole thing, just to be really, really clear, like nothing is set in stone, right? Like evidence, is constantly generated, data sources become available, there's new ways of thinking, there's connectivities made. So we're very much committed to this being an evergreen, um, revisited approach so we can continue to be you know, more meaningful and relevant to, to the work that, that everyone is doing. So we're open to, to suggestions and, and we really do want to, to hear from you in terms of how the work can be of even more value. And this suggestion is certainly one that we've thought about and, and continue to think about. Thanks, Gaia. Um, uh, seeing no more questions, I want to point out that the indicators info bases information has been popped into the chat line by Bill. Thanks again, Bill. And I just wanted to end from my part with great thanks to you all. Um, 
And really to build on what Guy was saying, that we want this to be a conversation, you have Karen's email. Please do also uh, fill out the survey that uh, is embedded in the deck that you're seeing. And um, we just really uh, appreciate the interest and engagement we've had on this file. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. And uh, I'll echo your, your thanks. Um, this has been a really, really informative webinar for me personally. And I want to thank all of, all of our uh, folks in the audience. Um, it's been great to, to see the level of interest. And uh, your questions have actually really uh, provided kind of an enriching discussion today. So thank you for that. Um, I want to thank uh, Tanya for a great job doing the moderating the question period. Um, that's it went really well today. Um, also want to thank uh, Dr. Gaia Jaraman and Karen Pearson for sharing their work and knowledge with, with us today. And I'm glad that um, Karen has shared her email. So if you want to be in touch to ask any further questions or, or learn any more, you can do that. Well, thanks everyone, and we'll wish you a goodbye and hope you have a great day.